said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. Beautiful. Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the men in the house. And uh, we appreciate you. We're glad that you're here. Pray your blessings over you. Let's open up a word of prayer and let's be in service. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for this time together. Together we do honor our fathers here. We honor you, our Heavenly Father. We praise you for your goodness life and life eternal. Pray that you would just be glorified today. Pray that you would speak to us. Pray that something would be said, Father, that would cause us to believe even more. Thank you for who you are. We love you. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen. Amen. Any announcements this morning we need to share with the body? Yes. Um, thanks, first of all, to everybody who helped down at a turning point yesterday. We had seven of us that went down and helped in their food pantry and doing uh, barbecue boxes and handing those out. Um, also, the sign-up sheet for coffee time is at the back because as of today, we officially started back with coffee time, and today it was in honor of the fathers. So all men in the church, if you didn't get a kolache or some fruit or a wonderful cinnamon roll, feel free to go in, or sweetbreads, the banana bread is wonderful. Um, feel free to go in and get yourself something before you leave today. Um, and then the last thing is this month's collection is... Uh, regular size boxes of cereal and it's being collected in the family center. Thank you. Let's stand together. There's nothing else we need to share. Be oh, one good. other thing. Sure. We want to make sure everybody comes to the potluck next week to tell Pastor Terry goodbye and good luck. He has done a wonderful job serving us the last three years and we want to make sure that he knows how much we care about him. Thank you. Let's Thank you. 
friend, um, she's continuing to struggle with this transition of a very sick mom and having lost her husband, so please keep her in your prayers. Of course, please pray for Corey. He continues to struggle. He's not really feeling well, so they're trying something new for the next two weeks, um, but please keep him in your prayers. This has been really rough for him. Um, of course, Father's Day, and thank you to all the fathers and all the people that help raise children, whether you've had children biologically or not. I think all the, the people that make an impact on kids are not just necessarily their biological parents. Keep in mind that Hiles as they, and East, as they travel home from their vacation, we are thankful to have um, everybody else back from their other vacation safely. And then pray for Turning Point um, and the outreach that they are doing, as well as pray for our church um, in this transition over the next month with blessings on Pastor Terry and his family, and especially as they have some health issues going on in their family with CJ and Patty who have been struggling with her knees. And the final thing was the wheat harvest is going on now, so please keep all those farmers that are trying to uh, get their jobs done as well as deal with the weather we're having. Struggling with his healing. I pray, Father, you would just touch him and 
moment you can do more than, than uh, anyone else can do in, in a lifetime. So I pray that you would touch it even now as we pray in the name of Jesus. And with the uh, Turning Point Outreach Ministry, we pray you to bless them in a special way, a special blessing over our harvest and our farmers. And pray the love would be good for them to get the harvest in. Pray for the transition, Lord, that the church would go on in might and strength and your blessing to be upon them in a special way that they can pastor. We pray for Larry, God, that you would touch him and heal his eyes. Just like you touched blind heart man's eyes, touch his eyes and let him heal him. I thank you for doing that. Thank you for all your blessings on all our men. And fathers, I pray that you would touch him in a special way. Now we pray the prayer that the Father taught Jesus to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was a true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. We were born not of blood, nor the will of it, flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. The glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Word of God for the people. Amen. Last week we talked about transforming truths from the Old Testament. This morning we're talking about transforming truths from the New Testament. We're going to start off by a story that I love to share about the little boy that was lost in, in the city. And as only you can in the city sometimes be lost and people just walk by and not care. But he's sitting there crying on the corner, and finally a police officer pulled up and said, Son, what's the problem? He says, he says, I'm, he says I'm lost. I'm scared. I'm on my mind. He said, Son, I want you to look as far down that street as you can. Look down as far as you can down that street. See if there's anything that can remind you of home. He says, No. No, I don't. I'm scared. I want my mind. He said, Son, look as far as you can down that street. See it. He said, oh, why that street is on both sides of that road. Said, as far as you can. Is there anything at all to remind you of, of your mom or home? He says, No, I don't. I just want to go home. One more time, he said, Son, would you look down the street? Look as far as you can see if there's anything that reminds you of home. He said, Yeah. Wiping tears off his eyes. He said, You see that building up there with that cross on top of it? You take me to that cross, and I'll find my way home. And that's the truth of it all, church. When you find the cross, take us to the cross where Jesus did on the cross, we'll find a way home. How, why did he come? That's what, how we're going to start this morning. He came to save his people, it says in Matthew 1 21, from their sins. Luke 19 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came to the world to save the sinners, of whom I am foremost of all. You ever feel like that sometimes? The foremost of all sinners? All that proceed. They laid at his feet the coats of the stone Stephen to death. So if he wasn't a murderer, he was an accessory to murder. And yet God would use him to write 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Incredible thing. Look how God changes lives. But he came to save, he came to seek and to save. He came to save the world from sinners. Then the next thing I noticed, and these are things I love to talk about, is the first message I shared with you is Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He would say in Mark chapter 1 verse 17, follow me and I will make you Come, fishers of men. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, he says, Do not fear, for now on you will be catching men. And I was asking some of the guys at the table they didn't fish anymore. I still feel embarrassed. I got a pond between me and about one of the park, the other parking lots over there. And I see a dude this morning, I saw a great blue heron sitting on top of one of the trees, just sitting there, just kind of looking around. And uh, that, that bird's done more fishing than I ever could have done, you know. <laughs> You're from the top of that tree. It's so, so close, but I think as a church, we can never forget that our goal as a church is to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I come to call the righteous, the sinners, to repentance. So when we follow, we fish. If we follow the dean of our box, we'll say the opposite has to be true. We don't follow, we don't fish. Now I love the story in John chapter 1. This is probably the summation of what we're just talking about right there in this, the last two verses. Where you have the men that are coming to Jesus, one of the two who had heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. This is in John chapter 1, verse 40, 41. He first came to his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. It's translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. I circled that in my Bible. He brought him to Jesus. That's our goal as Christians, is to bring people to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. He said, Look at, looking at him, he said, You're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which translate means Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee. He found Philip 
How many know that we bring people to Jesus, but sometimes Jesus finds us as well? Aren't you glad he found us? I'm glad he found me. I wasn't even seeking for him. I, actually, I can remember laying in Ohio on, on the ground at night, looking up at the stars and thinking, God is so big, I don't know how to get to him. I don't know how to have a relationship with him. And God in his infancy would move us from Ohio to Texas where I would be led to Christ by another 13-year-old boy would go 13 at a time and he led me to Christ at his house. And uh, I mean, there were some of the ministries and the miracles of God don't necessarily take place in the church. Jesus did 36 miracles, only three of them took place in the temple of the synagogue. What's he telling us? I want it to happen out in your homes. I want it to happen at your business. I want it to happen in the marketplace. Everywhere you go, people come to Christ. So we go on in the story. It says, and Philip came from Bethesda. Oh, by the way, Jesus told uh, Philip to follow me. Verse 44, and Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter, and he found Nathaniel. Some people say, I find everybody, I find my brother, I found him, he found me. Now I'm finding someone else. And he, he says, we found him who Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said, to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The wrong side of the tracks, that dog heap of the place. He said, come and see. And I think that's the great message of the church today. Why don't you just come and see? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Reminds me of a, a friend of mine that was from India that had never tasted watermelon. And he said, you got to taste it. Taste and see this good stuff. He tasted it. That is the most delicious ever. Taste and see that the Lord is what? It's good. He's good. Come and see. And then the next thing we see, just kind of going through the progression here. I love the fact that God's a God who answers prayer, aren't you? And uh, we mentioned this a little bit ago when I was praying. I said, ask it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Again, those are continuous action verbs in the Greek. Please keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking until it happens. It reminds me of the time that uh, we were in a, uh, I was in a, a junior nationalist at a, at a nature center in our city, our Kansas City campus. And, uh, we were out in the Arkansas River, it was probably the deepest knee hives in the summertime, so it was quite dry, but there was a lot of water still flowing through it, and muddy, just like there are, just like Missouri, mighty muddy. It was muddy, you couldn't see anything. And one of the, we were spread out probably over an area of 50, 50 feet or so, and one of the girls says, I lost my watch. Well, give it up, dog. Kiss it goodbye, it's gone. Not me, man. I said, God, you know where that watch is? He says, what's it look like? He says, white band, and it has, you see, we had to describe it. I told the Lord, I said, God, there's a watch in this river that means the lights was growing. It looks like this, and I'm afraid you'd help us find it. Two minutes later, a kid pulled up out of the water, that watch. Now, what do you think that did to my faith? It shot my faith up through the roof like you can't believe I gave all the glory to God. Ask, and be given to you. Seek, you will find, not going to be open to you. Another time we were at that, was when I was in Bible school, we went back to the nature center. My brother had let us use his truck. Two of my friends went out, we went out to the nature center, we're walking the trails. It's probably at least five or six miles of trails. We went all over them. We get back to the truck, and uh, I go to get the keys out of my pocket, out of my windbreaker. Not in that pocket. Not in this pocket. Not in my front. I'm touching every pocket I can. I'm looking on the ground. I'm panicking now. And then all of a sudden I said, guys, I can't find the keys. And uh, so we, just, we got in the service. So let's pray and believe God to show us where these keys are. And I know, remember one of the kids, one of the guys in my Bible school was there, Dan Taylor, is a great minister today down in uh, Arizona. He, for a long time, he was in the Robert Taylor Projects in, uh, in Chicago. And, uh, but just a tremendous man of God. So we got in the circle and prayed. So the guy, you know what these keys are? They're black with a silver tip on it, and it's got a, it's got a howl. Help us to find it. The sun was going down. The grass was tall. We walked for a while, and I remember at one point, on the trails we get off this property, we walk about a half a mile. I said, you know what, we walked up that hill to see the whole city valley. Let's go up that hill because I think that's where they might be. And so we walked up the hill, we spread out, walked up the hill, didn't find them, started coming down. And I noticed Dan had stopped. I turned around and Dan's holding his keys like this. His mouth was on the ground. He said, I was the last guy that could have believed that we were going to find those keys and we found them. And you'll never guess what the key chain, chain said. A wise choice. My friend had said we shouldn't run down the hill because the cows were on that. Put a lot of holes, could have broke our ankles. We ran that anyways, being young and stupid. And uh, but again, another tremendous victory for God to show me that if we ask anything and seek, we'll find. 
And then I love Matthew chapter 9. Probably Matthew is a great gospel to read. I mean, there's four gospels. Three were called synoptic gospels. And they, they, they're similar. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, almost 90% of what he wrote is unique. I found any of the other gospels. That's a neat way to look at it. But this is found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Therefore, beseech is a strong word in the Greek. It means to beg the Lord of the harvest to send the workers into his harvest. So we need to see like Jesus saw, feel like Jesus felt, pray like Jesus prayed, walk like Jesus walked, and talk like Jesus talked. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, One who abides in the mind himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. John chapter 7, verse 36, 46, the officer said, Never has a man spoke the way this man speaks, speaking of Jesus. And probably one of my favorite ones is Luke chapter 4, verse 22. And all were speaking well of him, speaking of Jesus, and wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? That's the way I want to talk. I want the words to be gracious. No matter what's going on, no matter how bad things get, we still can believe God to do incredible things. I remember the story um, of Pagani. He was a great violinist, get, a showman at best, but a very gifted violinist. And he was playing for a pack of tang, a house. And he was playing his last piece, and they were coming up, they were crescendoing to the very end of the of the piece, and uh, lo and behold, one of his violin strings broke. If you know anything about a violin, they have four strings, one breaks, it's hanging down, the conductor can see it, but somehow he puts the music on those three strings and continues to play. But then just a couple of minutes, the second string break, breaks. And now some of the people in the front row are singing. They're kind of wondering about what's going on here. But then just probably another 15 seconds, the next one broke, and we just Oh, there we go. I pushed the button. Sorry about that. This is the third string break. Now, all he has left to play is the one string. He's put all that music somehow on that one string, and he finishes up the the, uh, the song, and the people went crazy. Bravo, bravo. They get up to usher out because Paganini never does an encore. Then it might be the better game. I said, keep pushing the button, Chef. So he says, no, no, wait, wait. He said, come back in and sit down. He said, I want you to see something. He holds up the violin, now they can all see the three strings hanging down. He says, Paganini! And one string. And he plays a solo on that last string. And for some of us, the last string we have in our life is a. Well, we need an extra battery back there, my brother. So somehow he packs all that music on that one string. And some, for some of us, the last string we have in our life is the one thing no one can ever take away from you, and that's your attitude. Everything can be falling away from you. People can be saying stuff. Things can be happening in your life. You feel like you don't have anything left. But one string left, and that's your attitude. And nobody can take that from you. Thank Something we like to do during the service is not about halfway through and just yeah, yeah. Done better. It's, so when things start falling apart, things stop working, the last attitude, the last thing you have in your life that's still effective is that last stream that you're at. Victor Franco was another great example of that. How he was in the Nazi prison camps. And uh, they literally stripped him of every piece of clothing he had on stage before this Nazi tribunal naked. They even went as far as to take the wedding ring off his finger. He said, you know anything you like to say? He said, I like to say something. He said, you can take my wife, you can take my kids, you can take my clothes, you can take the wedding ring off my finger, but one thing you can't take, that's my choice of attitude. Victor Franco will go on to survive that Nazi prison camp, going to become a great author and a great man of God because he either realized you can't take my attitude. That's one thing you can't take. A lot of people say, you steal my joy. Nobody can steal your joy. You can give it away. Nobody can take it because that's yours. Nobody can mess with that. Again, we talked about 36 miracles that Jesus did, only three taking place in the temple and the synagogue. Every miracle that Jesus did that happened for him happened because people were desperate, they were dependent, and they were weak. The Bible says when you're weak, then you are what? Strong. That's what Paul said. So they were 
desperate, dependent, we reminds me again of the story of little Benjamin at our church in their woodshop that I pastored in the inner city. He was probably four or five years old, severely both legs. I've never seen both legs on, on anybody that, that bad. And they were going to do a radical surgery. They were going to cut off his, his feet above the ankle and place a rod through his bones to keep him from, going, from bending any more than what they already were. He'd walk around with his crutches. You could hear him anywhere he was coming. You Benjamin was coming. He was a real blessing. We, and we prayed that God would heal this boy somehow. And uh, a lot of people were praying. I think sometimes when a lot of people pray, then nobody gets the glory to God. Amen? And we say, oh, it's my prayer. I just, you know, it has nothing to do with you. It has something to do with God. Answering prayer. It's all about him. So this little boy, one day before, was a week before the surgery, they went to the doctor and they did a, X-ray on his legs, he said, and he came back in the doctor was like he'd seen a ghost or something. He said, what have you been doing to this boy? And his dad said, uh, Flintstone vitamins? The guy's like, that's not going to do anything. He said, something's happened to this boy. And he puts the X-rays up on the chart and flips them on, and there is his legs are perfectly straight. He said, not only will he not need these crutches anymore, he's not going to need this surgery. This boy is different. He said, I don't know what happened. His mom says, I can tell you what happened. God touched my boy and healed him. That's what happened. Of course, he wasn't having anything to do with that, but it still was the truth. So we did that have, miracles happen when we're desperate, when we're dependent, then we're weak. Then we read in John, the three proofs of disciples. We've mentioned this a lot, but I think it's really good to, to hear John say this. John's the only one who brings us out of the disciples. He said, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples. The disciple will stay with this book, will believe it, but no one else will. Okay, so how many of the ones that times will change? God's word will never change. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. I'm getting all this following message text I just want to turn my thing off. I apologize. <laughs> it's usually dead silent during this time. I didn't know I'm at church. The three proofs of the disciple, so you continue in his word. The second one is in John 13, 35. And Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So you continue his word, you have love for one another. And the third one is, my father is glorified by this, John 15, 8 says, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. Then just want some fruit, he wants you to bear much fruit and prove to be his disciples. John chapter 5 talks about people in the house of Powerless people in the house of mercy, they were in the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. They were powerless. Listen to what it says here in John chapter 5. And now I have 20 more to go, so we're right about halfway the house. After these things, John loves to write that those words, metatata. says there were a feast of the Jews, and the, uh, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You always, always go up to Jerusalem because it's up on the now he was in Jerusalem by the sheep's gate of pool, which is in Hebrew called Bethesda, having five porticos. Again, Bethesda means house of mercy. In their life, all of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel lord, <coughs> excuse me, went down in certain seasons into the pool, stirred up the waters, and whoever then first, after stirring up the waters, stepped in, was made well, <coughs> whatever disease he was afflicted. <coughs> He who had been there, there was a man there who had been ill for 38 years, and Jesus knew he was laying there and had been in there, that position for a long time. He said, Do you wish to get well? He says, I don't have anybody put me in the water. Every time I try to step in, someone steps before me. That's not what I asked him. Do you wish to get well? The one who could heal, everyone in that whole place was there, and yet they were waiting for something else to happen. Let's not wait for something else to happen before God moves. They'll say, Well, this happens, and so and so happens, and somebody steps in here, and this happens, and that happens, and then we're going to get this. Mm, Jesus is your answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the answer. The next thing we see in the scripture here, talking about transforming truths, this is probably one of my favorite ones, is the seven I am's found in the Gospel of John. Literally, we've learned about this. It's ego and me. It almost sounds like let go of me. That's the best way I've learned how to remember those Greek words. Ego and me. Jesus said ego and me. The bread of life. I am the bread of life. And that literally is a Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament, Greek Septuagint of the New Old Testament, and that's YHWH. Jesus says, I'm God. I am. YHWH of John, uh, Genesis, 
excuse me, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Who should I say to the people of Simeon? He said, You tell them I am that I am sent you. Y H W H. Jesus is claiming this. He says, Ego in me, the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, he who believes me will never thirst. I am the bread, the living bread. John chapter 6, verse 51. Who then say, Jesus will say to them, I am Ego in me, the light of the world. He who follows after me will not walk in darkness. He will have the light of life. And then he says in chapter 9, verse 5, While I am in the world, I am a go and be the light of the world. So he's the bread of life, he's the light of the world. And then in John chapter 5, 8, verse 58, they were talking to him about Abraham. He says, You're not even 50 years old. How do you know Abraham? He says, Hey, before Abraham, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, a go and be, I am. And they picked, they knew exactly what he was saying. They picked up rocks and stone to death. He says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am YH and UH. That's why they picked up the stones, because he claimed to be God, and he was. John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am Ego and me, the door and the sheep. Then he would say in chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone that enters through me, he will be saved. He will go in and out of my pasture. And then just a couple more here. John chapter 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. Ego and me, the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You can say three verses later, Ego and me, the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. And then three more. He says, I ego and me, the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. And then he asks the questions. And he's asking you and me today, do you believe this? Well, I believe it. I believe, I believe that ego and me, the resurrection. Then he says, they go and be the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. And before that, he was saying in John chapter 14, verse 6, they go and be, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Again, how are we going to get to heaven? What do you trust to get you into heaven? Peter would say in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's talking in context there of Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father by me. We also learn that over the years here that uh, this is not Burger King and you don't get it your way. Amen. We get it his way. His way is the best way. His way is better than Burger King or anybody else's way. He's a great guy. Then John has found a beautiful word in John chapter 1 verse 12 and read it. But as many as receive them to them, you need the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. The word believe is mentioned 98 times in the Gospel of John. 21 chapters, 98 times in all forms of the word, believe, believing, believe, believer, all forms of the word, 98 times, that's more than all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, he says you got to believe, I, as many as received him, have you ever received him this morning, if you have, he gave you the right to become a child of God, even to those who believe in his name, we told the story of Blondie, Blondie is probably one of my favorite characters to talk about, because of what he'd done, he'd strung a cord from Canada to the United States across the Niagara Falls, 180 feet. He was about 160 feet above the water. One fall, one slip. Wrong move, and you're falling to your death. There's no way probably to ever survive that. And he would, the first time he got there, he kind of, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have Facebook or anything like that, social media, so they did it by word of mouth in my newspaper. So he told the people that he was going to walk across this, and they came out to watch him, a good crowd. And he says, how many believe I can do this? He says, oh, we believe. And he got up on that tight rope. He had a real long rope that, or a pole that he hung on to. He got about halfway out and he sat down for a while because he was tired. And uh, there was the main mist was below him, so he lowered down the rope and got a bottle of water, brought it up to him, a drink of water, stood back up, walked to the other side. Right before he got to the end of that, the end of his destination to the United States side, he turned around, put the pole down, and did a back flip, landed on his feet, turned around, walked up, and said, I'll be back tomorrow. These people went crazy. They're like, who in the world is this guy? And so he would go on to do it with a wheelbarrow. I says, how many believe I can do this with a wheelbarrow blindfolded? And so he would put a, a blindfold on, take this wheelbarrow, and obviously the wheels were off of it so it could roll on the, on the cord. Halfway across again, he would stop, cook up an omelet, blindfolded. Probably wasn't the greatest cooking. Omelet he probably ever had in his life. And he would finish that and go to the other side. He said, oh, back. He would go on to do it in stilts, 
on a bicycle in a gunny sack, and then you'd also do it backwards, walk backwards. And each time the crowd would get bigger and bigger, and each time you'd say, do you believe I can do this? What would prove to be the, one of the, the last times they ever did it, he said, how many believe that I can do this blindfold? Oh, we believe. He said, how many believe I can do it in a gunny sack? Oh, we believe. How many believe I can do this with a, on a bicycle? Oh, we believe. How many believe I can do it? He went down through all the whole list. He says, he says, we believe. He says, how many believe I can do it with a man on my back? He said, oh, we believe. He said, I need a volunteer. <laughs> no volunteers that day. Finally, he would say it again, and his manager, his, his name was Henry, would come out, I think probably feeling embarrassed that he couldn't find anybody, the fact that he believed in him so much. Do nothing about balancing. He said, whatever you do, don't trust in what you do. Trust in me, Blondie would tell him. He said it would be the most horrific, horrifying thing he ever did in his entire life. So he gets up on his back, and the guy's hanging on to him, and uh, just clinging on to him while Blondie still has the pole, this long pole, about halfway across one of the guy rails that held the, the uh, rope steady and began to sway, and began to violently sway back and forth. And this man is feeling like, I'm dying. I'm going to fall to my death. I don't know nothing about this. And Blondine would run up to the next, next cord and grab a hold of the cord just to stabilize it and then continue on. He said about halfway across, he had to get him off his back because he was so heavy. How many of you do that sometimes with your kids, let alone a grown man? Uh, I have to say with my neck, I don't know what it is, and when my kids would get up on my shoulders, it pinched my nerves. All of a sudden, my, my hands would start going numb. My arms would go numb. I have to get him off my shoulder so I can imagine having a full grown man on my back and putting him down and having him trust not in himself what he could do, but trust only in me. He would get him back on his back to the other side and he never walked across it again. Why? They didn't believe. Because when you believe, you'll put your whole life into it. It's not like the story of the chick chicken and the and the uh, pig who decided to make breakfast for their for the farmer, they loved him so much, they wanted to do something special for him. They thought they would make pancakes and, and fruit. He says, we can't make pancakes. We don't have any ingredients for it. We don't even have any thumbs. We can't make pancakes. That's not a good idea. Chick says, oh, I got it. Let's make bacon and eggs. And the king says, no way. He says, for you, that's just a contribution. For me, that's total commitment. You're just going to contribute to the egg. I got to lay my life in it. And, uh, but we need to be dedicated to the Lord and see and see him do whatever he wants to do in our lives. This is kind of been a smorgasbord this morning, kind of a, like we talked about last week, kind of a all you can eat buffet, kind of pick and choose what you want here, but just some of the things that have really touched my life over the years. And then I love the, the last words that we'll say this morning is what Jesus' mother said to the servant at the wedding of Cain and Galilee. And I had the privilege of being married to my wife again at the Cain and Galilee. That was beautiful. And uh, he said, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. And that's the power of the Word of God. Let's just pray. Father, thank you this morning that you love us so much. You've given so much, so much tremendous truth that I can begin to even touch the service of this, service of everything that you have for us. It's powerful. It's living. It's active. It's sharpened into a disorder. It gives a book that's the same here as it is in foreign countries as it is from gender, male and female, to, to uh, all ages, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years from now, that's going to be. It's the same. It never changes what a powerful living word we have today. And I thank you that you said heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. We can trust you. And there's no other way to be happy to be saying the way to go, but to trust and obey. Help us, God, to be believers. Help us, God, to be seekers, seeking and saving that which is lost, bringing people to Jesus. I pray, Father, that this church will continue to prosper and grow, and, and uh, Father, as people come to Jesus, that's the greatest delight of my heart. Probably that's the evangelist within me that sees people coming to Jesus. That's, it doesn't get better than that. You came to seek and to save that which is lost. Help us, God, to have that very heart within us, to see as you saw, to feel as you felt, to pray as you prayed, to walk as you walked. And heed the words that Mary said. Whatever he says to you, do it. It's that so. In Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are a blessing. And it's been fun to stand up here and
and appreciate these years. It's fun to, I love to have you guys laugh. Some of the ministers joke that you have to be halfway funny if you laugh your head off. This is smart. So one that really is funny, that you really hate on that really just kind of eggs us on the thing. I was going to say it's funny. No. But uh, God has given us a lot of transforming truths. We're going to stand together and sing. We bring the sacrifice of praise to the house of the Lord. And let's bring in praise this morning as we go. And if you need prayer for anything, I want to meet you down here. Thank you, Jesus. I will pray with you this morning. Let's just stand and sing. Jesus.